Our God makes wonderful promises to his people, promises that the word of God reveals to us. These promises, when we pursue them and live according to them, they are going to lead us into God's will and to receive the Lord's anointing. But the problem is this. Many people are following after their hopes, their dreams, and what they want to be. And when we pursue things not based upon scriptural truth, but simply based upon what we want or what we hope it will be, then we are easily deceived. See, too many people are believing what they want to believe instead of believing what the word of God reveals. Well, in this time of study, we're going to be answering the question, will the church see the Antichrist? And let me simply share with you that how you answer that question is going to bring about a lot of response from individuals because so many people have been taught that the church will never see the Antichrist. Remember what I shared with you earlier. Many times people simply like to be told kind of thoughts and beliefs that are encouraging, even though there's not a biblical basis for it. For example, I know one preacher, and he used to say, I'm not waiting for the Antichrist. I'm waiting for the real Christ. And people love to hear that. But what does the scripture say? See, we need to have a theology. We need to base our life on that which is biblically defensible, meaning this, that we need to look at the word of God, scripture, and form our beliefs, our doctrines, our theology based on what the scripture reveals and not, as I would suggest to you that many do, is that they build a theology based upon assumptions. Assumptions that lead them to the conclusions that they want to believe in. And that's why people will say this. Because we know that all seven years is God's wrath. And because we know, and I agree with this part, that we will never experience God's wrath. And that the Antichrist, he functions in Daniel's seventh week. That's true. He does. Therefore, we will never see the Antichrist. But here's the problem. Nowhere in the scripture can we prove that the wrath of God begins at the beginning of those final seven years. We have seen three times and now the fourth based upon the revelation of John in the book called Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5, that the Antichrist is going to have authority to function freely, and he's going to do so prior to the wrath of God. So if we rightly understand Scripture, and the promise of the rapture is we will never experience the wrath of God. And the wrath of God does not begin until Revelation chapter 8. Then what do we know? Well, we know that the church will meet the Antichrist. And what I'd like to do, and we're not going to spend a long time doing this in this session, I'd like to look at a few scriptures. And through these few scriptures, we're going to see the truth in fact, that the church will experience that Antichrist rule, at least the Antichrist empire and witness his revealing at the abomination of desolation. Take out your Bible and look with me to 1 John and chapter 2. 1 John and chapter 2. Now, even though the work of of the Antichrist is spoken of in many places. When we go to the word of God and look specifically for passages where the Antichrist is named by that term, the Antichrist, 
There's not a wealth of them. There are very few, but they are most informing. So look with me, as I said, to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. He says, children, and this is a term of endearment. And we need to remember that, that John is writing here in his first epistle, and he's writing to believers who he cares deeply about. And therefore, he says to them, children, it is the last hour. Now, that last hour means that, that the events of the last days are close. And he's going to tell us something concerning this last hour. He says, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Now, my question to you is this. Why would John be speaking to believers about the Antichrist who is coming if the church were to never see the Antichrist, that it's not a factor? Well, I believe that John is speaking about the Antichrist because he will be a factor for the church in the last days. He says, even many Antichrists have come, meaning... There has been numerous examples of those who work and do the things that the Antichrist is going to do, by which we know because of these false individuals, these evil people, those who are led by satanic desires and influence rather than the Holy Spirit. He tells us that now we know it is the last hour. Now, that term, last hour, means this, that, that Messiah has come, he has done the work of redemption, and the last days can come at any time. What I mean by that is this. God, if he chooses, he can bring about the end times event in any generation he chooses. And what John is saying is to the church 2,000 years ago and to us today, that we need to be people who are watching, people who are awake, people who are looking for the last day's events. And he says, speaking about something that's going to accompany the work of the Antichrist, look at verse 19. It says, they went out from us. Now, if you do a good study of this verse, many scholars believe that what John is speaking of is something that we studied earlier, and that is the apostasy. That there are going to be people that turn away from truth. There are going to be individuals, and we're warned not to be weighed down by the cares of, of this life, this world. And he says, look again at verse 19, because of this apostasy, because of a wrong way of thinking, because of deception, they went out from us. But notice what he says, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have continued with us. But, and the implication is, they went out that it might be manifested that none of them were of us. Who's the us? Genuine believers, true disciples. And those that are going to embrace the apostasy, those who are going to rebel against the righteous standards of God and his purposes, those who will not endure and persevere and overcome, they are not true believers. They are going to move away. They are going to embrace the lie. They are going to embrace heresy. And they will not remain in the body of believers. They never were true believers. They were never committed to the kingdom promises. Look, if you would, to verse 20. But he says, you, however, have an anointing. 
Now, we have an anointing, and that anointing in the scripture, if you do a good study of anointing, one is anointed for a purpose, for a call. And again, we're talking about the Antichrist, him coming and doing what we know the Antichrist is going to do. And he's telling this congregation, you have been anointed, and I would derive from that for such a time of this, that we can bear witness, that we can testify, that we can show others that we belong to the true Savior, that we're not going to fall for the deceit of this Antichrist. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. That is an expression of discernment. You are going to perceive the things that you need to perceive in order to walk faithfully, to have that God-pleasing testimony. He says, verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and no lie is of the truth. So he's pointing out that there's a great distinction and there's that same word. There is going to be a clear separation between those who are going to fall for the deception of the Antichrist, who are going to participate with him, who are going to go out from the real believing community. And there's going to be a remnant that's left behind, that's left in the midst of a time of intense persecution that is coming that the bible speaks of over and over look if you would to verse 22 now we're going to see in this last part of this section and the one we're going to in a few minutes also in first john but in chapter four we're going to see what is the message of the antichrist and that's important that we know it and I would say to you that I see evidence of that message growing in the world today. What is that message? Well, look, if you would, to verse 22. He asks a question. Who is a liar? And he answers it. The one who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah. This one is an antichrist who denies the father and the son. Now, this concept of God and Messiah as father and son, it speaks clearly to the divinity of Messiah. And in my experience, the emails that we get, the criticism that we receive is so frequently because we believe in the divinity of Messiah. We believe in the implications of the virgin birth. In other words, we embrace the doctrine of the Trinity. Yes, I know that word does not appear in the biblical text, but the truth of the Trinity is found numerous places in the scripture. And it speaks about the Godhead, the three in one and such. All of this is found biblically if you're using the Texas Receptus. And he says, he is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Who denies the Son does not have the Father. Now, let me tell you that there is a teaching within the Messianic world that is of the Antichrist. And this is what people say. They say, if you believe in the God of Israel, because God the Father and God the Son is one, then if you believe in the Father, then by default you're also believing in the Son. That is totally unbiblical. We see also in John's gospel, as well as here, in order to know the Father, in order to have a relationship with the Father, first, you must know the Son. Is that not what he says? Look at verse 23. 
whoever denies the son does not have the father either. You reject the son. What's he talking about? The divinity of the son. If you don't accept a divine Messiah, you are rejecting him and you are rejecting the father. And he concludes this section by saying, but he who acknowledges the son. What does it mean? Acknowledge the son. That he is the son of God. That this relationship is between father and son. And I'm a human being because my father is a human being. And Messiah Yeshua is divine because his father is God. And therefore, he is God as well. This is foundational. Let's move to our next verse. Look, if you would, to chapter 4 of this same first epistle of John, chapter 4. And look with me, if you would, to verse to verse 2. Notice what it says. By this you know the Spirit of God. Now, the Spirit of God, the first place that he's mentioned is in the book of Genesis, where it says, Ruach Elohim, Merachefet Al Pnei Hamaim, which means the Spirit of God was hovering, moving above the, the face of the waters. And what happens? Through the work of the Spirit of God and through the Word of God, there was a change, a glorious change, a good change. And that word good is related to the will of God. Through the work of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God, this creation came into order. This creation was changed so that it reflected the will of God. And that's why God looked and he said, behold, it is good, very good. And what the scripture is saying here is this, that the spirit of God brings about God's order in our life. But you only have the spirit of God if you believe in the divinity, the right identity of Messiah. Look again at the text, verse two. By this, you know, the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Messiah Yeshua has come in the flesh is of God. Now, what's he talking about here? Come in the flesh. He's talking here about the incarnation. Not just that Messiah is a human being, but he's come in the flesh. Speaking of the incarnation, that Messiah, that he is fully man, and fully God. And we're going to see that as the time of the Antichrist comes near, there's going to be more and more people rejecting that, moving away from that, denying who Yeshua truly is. He says here, every spirit that confesses that Messiah Yeshua has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Messiah Yeshua has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is where it gets important. It says, and this one is of the Antichrist. Now, so many Bibles add a word, a word that they ought not. And there's a reason for this. Most of the time, when scripture is manipulated, it is for a theological purpose. And this is what many people want to say. Well, the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world, but not the Antichrist yet. But if you remove that italicized word and you just read it for what it says, look again at this verse, verse three at the end. And this is of, of the Antichrist. So one who denies the divinity of Messiah, this one is of the Antichrist. It doesn't say anything about the spirit of the Antichrist. It says this one is of the Antichrist, which he says this, which you have heard was coming, but notice what he says, is now already in the world. Now, why is that? important 
because John wrote this epistle nearly 2,000 years ago. And John is saying the Antichrist is already at work, not just the spirit, but the Antichrist himself. And what we find is this. There's a very important scripture. In fact, tonight, while I was not teaching, I was looking at the Israeli news and the prime minister spoke about the enemy. And he used a biblical term to describe Hamas. He used the term Amalek. And Amalek, as you probably know, is related to Haman. And that Haman that's mentioned in the book of Esther is a typology for the Antichrist. And what we see in the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 25, it tells us to remember Amalek in every generation. And if you do a good study of that passage, what it tells us is this, that in every generation, there is the enemy. And that great enemy that wants to destroy the people of God and work against the purposes of God is indeed the Antichrist. One of the ways that he is referred to from an old covenant perspective is by that term Amalek. And it says, you will have war with him in every generation. So we need to realize that the Antichrist is not some entity that has no influence. He has influence. He just hasn't been revealed. Remember, there is that restrainer who we do not know who he is, but you know his purpose. His purpose is to restrain the Antichrist from being revealed until that proper time. And what does he do? He just steps aside. He moves from the midst. It does not in any way that language of that text in no way. I'm speaking about 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. It does not speak about him being taken away or removed, but it simply speaks of him stepping aside at the right time according to the purposes of God. Well, I want to look at another passage of scripture that hopefully will inform us concerning this question. Look, if you would, to the book of Luke and chapter 21. Now, over this conference, we have looked at the Olivet Discourse, that is Messiah's teaching about the last days. And we've looked at it from Matthew and from Mark. And now I'd like to look at it briefly from the book of Luke and chapter 21. And I want us to, to ask ourselves a question. What is going on? Who is behind it? And what is happening to believers? And when we look at this, there is absolutely no reason to bring this, this concept that is not biblical of tribulation saints. Look with me to Luke chapter 21 and verse, verse 12. Now, if you read a few verses in front of this, we see that we're talking about those birth pains, those wars and rumors of wars. Nation, and that means an ethnic group or a tribe rising up against another. And also country against country. And he says there will be earthquakes and famines and not just that, but also that there will be trouble in this world. Great trouble. Now, there's no reason to believe that the church won't be here for that. Why? Because the wrath of God has not began. We'll see a clear indication of when the wrath of God begins in this passage. But look at verse 12, Luke chapter 21, verse 12. But before all of these things. Now, this word for before can mean before in time or before in importance. And what we're speaking about here 
is of great importance. We find that Messiah wants his disciples to realize this because, yes, there's those birth pains, but that will all bring about a situation that will give a believer an opportunity to testify, to bear witness, and hear that very carefully. This is what we're called to do in the midst of those last days. It is going to be the basis for being persecuted and suffering and being rejected. But understand something. Messiah was rejected as well. They hated him and they're going to hate us. They persecuted him for who he was and what he stood for. And we will be persecuted as well. Look at verse 12. But before all of these things, they will lay hands upon you and what? Persecute you. Now, who do you think is the source of this persecution? He's not talking about here, and we'll see this in a moment, things relating to in the past, that destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. No, he's talking about the birth pains. We've established that. And these are end time events. So he says, they will persecute you and deliver you up to synagogues. And this, again, is not speaking about a Jewish house of worship. It's speaking about community centers. Synagogues, if you do a good study, will find that synagogues originated in the Greek empire. And they were places of administration. They were where local government functioned, where there were courts and such, and this gathering place for the community. He is not speaking here about Jewish places of worship. We have to understand the scripture correctly and the biblical backgrounds and don't make assumptions based upon when we hear the word synagogue, what we think about. He says, they will persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and rulers. Why? For my name's sake. And it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. That's what we're supposed to do in the midst of that Antichrist empire. To testify to bear witness to the truth. Isn't that what we learn from John as well? And what is the truth that we should emphasize? Who Yeshua is and what he has done and what he's going to do. And what he's going to do at the end of the church age is that he's going to remove us from this world before the wrath of God. But there's no scripture and do me a favor, don't believe me. Get some materials, Bibles, excuse me, get some books and see what these so-called experts that teach that the church will never see the Antichrist. Listen to their logic. Pay attention to all the assumptions that they make and how they interpret passages. And you're going to find that their interpretations do not match the revelation of God's word. He says, but this will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you're going to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which your adverses, adversaries, remember that, we're going to have adversaries that your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist and you will be betrayed remember we talked about this from mark's gospel you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends and they will put some of you to death so we are going to suffer for our faith that's nothing new remember what we talked about earlier how paul praise those in Thessalonia 
for going through much persecution. It was in the plural persecutions and much tribulations. That's our call. That's what we're supposed to do. You see, if you were to ask me, what is the prophetic message for the church today? This is what I would say. Take up your cross and follow me. We are called to be willing to lay down our life for our faith. And what it tells us here is that many are going to do just that. We are going to be persecuted, arrested, put in prison, and even be martyred for the faith. Now, what does the other say about this? Well, when we look at their teachings, they say something very differently. And what they teach is a, a scenario that the word of God does not agree with. See, we're going to be persecuted. And what do they say? Well, there's a book coming out. And I saw the, the introduction for this book on YouTube. And the name of the book is called The Great Disappearance. And I don't know what the book states, but when you look at the trailer for the book that's released on YouTube, it talks about how when the rapture happens, the world is going to be confused. The world is going to be bewildered. They're not going to know what is going on because all of these people suddenly are not going to be there. And this is this great disappearance that the author is speaking of. But here's what I would say to you. And I would say to the author respectfully, and I have much respect for him. He is a godly man, but we simply disagree because I don't see, and if I'm wrong, share with me the verses. I have no problem with making a video saying, I taught this, but I was set straight by someone else. And I didn't know these verses, and now I've changed my views. I'll be happy to do that. There's no shame in admitting that you're wrong. Been wrong many times. But what I would say to you is this. I do not know any verses that speak about the rapture, that says the world is going to be astonished by this, that the world is going to be amazed. See, when I look at the rapture and the scripture that relates to it, it is uniquely, did you hear that? It is uniquely for believers, for the congregation of the redeemed. I don't see any scripture that speaks of the rapture taking place and the world taking notice of it, being mystified, being shocked, being confused, being bewildered. I don't see that in the scripture any place. And therefore, I choose not to present something unless there is clear biblical evidence for doing so. And I'll tell you something else. See, why? Will the world not be amazed by the rapture? I'll tell you why. Because of what we're reading right now in Luke 21. What we read in Mark 13. And what is that? That believers during the Antichrist rule, the empire that he is going to rule over, we are going to be persecuted. We are going to be arrested. We are going to be put to death. Let me give an example of this. My wife and I know a woman. Her name is Anna. And she went through a very horrible experience in her life called the Shoah, which is the Holocaust. And we have some dear friends that we love very much. And they knew Anna. And they went with her back to the country that she was born in, that grew up in. And what happened? She went to the home, but it had been destroyed. 
but she looked across the street and there was the home of her childhood friend. So she went to the door and we're talking about so many years later, she knocked on the door. True story. Who do you think answered? Her childhood friend, this other girl, and they embrace. She was invited in. They talked for a moment. And then this so-called friend said, you know, we never knew what had happened to you. Now, I don't believe that was true at all. And neither did Anna. She ended up leaving and never wanting to go back. But there is something to be said. And that is what happened in the Holocaust is that they rounded up the Jewish people. They were there one day and gone the next. And they knew what had happened. They were taken to these death camps. And they were murdered. And other atrocities were done to them. But little by little, they just disappeared. And people went on with their life. And what is going to happen in the last days based upon this scripture and others? We are going to be persecuted. We are going to be arrested. We are going to be put into prison. And it says here in this text, and you will be put, some of you, to death. Verse 17. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But here's the verse that you need to hold on to. And that is this. But, verse 18, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, and that is a word of endurance. It is a word of perseverance. By your patience, you will possess your soul. Meaning this, as you endure for his sake. You are going to grow and mature. And when it says you will possess your soul, it's talking about self-control. You will, through the leadership and the anointing of the Spirit, you will live an obedient life. A life that is a God-pleasing testimony in the midst of great suffering. So I don't believe for a moment that the rapture, is going to be some spectacle that the world will see and wonder, what does this all mean? I don't think that because I don't see any scripture to support such a belief. Now, there's movies about that. There's popular books that have been written about that. But we do not see a scripture that in any way leads any credence to such a view. Well, I want us to turn to another scripture in the book of Revelation. Look with me to Revelation chapter 14, the book of Revelation and chapter 14. Now I had spoken a little bit about the 144,000. And in Revelation chapter seven, we know that they are Jewish. All of them are Jewish and they're on earth. But when we get to chapter 14, I believe that we're dealing with a different group because they're not on earth. They are in heaven. And we're going to learn how they get there and when they get there. And this is so informing. So look with me to Revelation chapter 14. And I like to begin, and this will just be a brief few verses. Look with me to verse 8. 9. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark upon his forehead or upon his hand, this one himself will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength in the cup of his indignation. 
he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of who else? The lamb. Now, for many people, this is a shocking verse. Yes, they know about the lake that burns with fire. But what may surprise some is that Messiah is going to oversee and observe those ones who took the mark of the beasts, who were not faithful. He's going to observe their eternal torment in the lake of fire and brimstone. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night because they worship the beast and his image. Whosoever receives the mark of his name. Now notice the mark of his name speaking about character. But notice verse 12. What an important verse. Now remember, there's those individuals that say, you know, in chapters 2 and 3, the word church appears 19 times. But never again after that is the church ever spoken of. Really? Well, what does it say here? Look at verse 12. Here is the patience. That word means endurance. It's a word of persevering in the midst of pain and suffering and opposition. He says, here is the patience of who? The saints. And when we look at the new covenant, and that's where we're reading from the new covenant, the book of Revelation. In the new covenant, saints are believers. And that's who we're talking about here. This 144,000 of chapter 14. We're going to learn more about them. He says here, here is the patience of the saints. Those who what? Who keep the commandments of God and faith in Yeshua. What an important passage of scripture. It teaches something. If you look at that and you know the laws of hermeneutics, it tells us this. What is faith? What does faith lead us to do? To keep the commandments of God. So faith in Messiah will work itself out in our life to make us obedient to the commandments of God. And then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, in the midst of the Antichrist rule. How do we know we're talking about the Antichrist rule? Well, because what's emphasized? The mark of the beast. That is a mark that shows that you pay allegiance, that you will be loyal to that Antichrist empire. And what it says here in regard to the saints, notice verse, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write down, blessed are the ones who die, who die in the Lord from now on. Now, when is this happening? Again, you will have those individuals that saying, well, it's Antichrist. These must be who? tribulation saints, those who come to faith after the rapture. Well, there's a problem with that. And that is this. Those who teach that, they would say, and I would agree with this part, the rapture takes place before the wrath of God. But here's the problem for them. When we read in this passage and continue in the next verses, we see something we see that the wrath of God has not come yet. What do we see? Look, if you would, to verse 14. Then I looked, John is speaking, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud, one who sat like the Son of Man. I would ask you, who is this one on the cloud that, that is like the Son of Man? Obviously. It's referring to Yeshua, the Savior. And he having he has on his head 
a golden crown. Why? He's Messiah and Messiah, that word is related to king. And in his hand, a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple. This is the temple in heaven, not in Jerusalem, crying with a loud voice to him. To who? To Yeshua, the one who sat upon the cloud. And he says, thus your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth, for it is ripe. So he who sat upon the cloud thrust his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, what is that speaking of? That is speaking of the rapture. Now, why am I so sure? Well, those people who do not agree with me, and that's fine. But they teach the same thing that I do in regard to the timing of the rapture. They say that the rapture will happen before the wrath of God. Our difference is that they believe all seven years is the wrath of God. Again, I challenge you, help me out, set me straight. Where is the verse of scripture that says all of Daniel's 70th week, all of these final seven years are God's wrath? I don't know it. If I'm wrong, I'll gladly admit it. I like, from a personal standpoint, their theology. But when I'm bound to scriptural truth, I can't accept it. But they do teach correctly that the rapture will happen before the wrath of God. But what do we know? The wrath of God has not happened yet. We see that this harvest that Messiah does takes place first. Why do I say that? Well, look now. To verse 17, it says, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And that other angel that came out, there was another one from the altar, and he had power over fire. Fire represents that last day judgment. It is a symbol of the wrath of God. And he cried out with a loud cry to him who had that sharp sickle saying, thus end your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. What does that mean? It is time for the wrath of God. Verse 19. So the angel thus his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. And what did he do with those vines and those grapes? We don't have to guess. We don't have to speculate. He threw it into the great winepress of what? The wrath of God. So we see again a perfect example of the fact that the rapture happens when? Not before the final seven years. But the scripture says simply before and closely before the wrath of God happens. So they were threw into this great winepress of the wrath of God. Verse 20. And the winepress was trampled outside the city. This is this holy city, the new Jerusalem. And blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle. Now, this holy city is really not the new Jerusalem. I was wrong. It's Jerusalem of today. And notice that it says the blood came out of that winepress up to the horse's bridle for a great distance. What do we know? We know that the rapture happens before God's wrath comes. And when we look at Revelation 14, that 144,000 represents in chapter 14, the church, the rapture church that is going to be taken out of this world before the wrath of God. Let me conclude this message by simply saying this. When we look at that number, 144,000, remember what I shared last night. The number 12 
is a kingdom number. It speaks about the kingdom people. Whether we're talking about the 12 apostles or the 12 tribes of Israel, those patriarchs, 12 relates to the kingdom. Whether we're talking about those 24 elders, two times 12, or the wall of the New Jerusalem, 144 cubits, or those 12 gates or those 12 foundations, or the distance of that New Jerusalem by breadth and width, 144,000 stadiums. What we find here is the number 144,000 relates to the kingdom as well as 144, as well as 24 and 12. And therefore, when we look at Revelation chapter 7, we're talking about that remnant of Israel that is going to be brought to faith. It's a kingdom number, 144,000. And it represents a remnant of the tribes of Israel that are going to come to faith. But when we look at Revelation chapter 14, it's speaking about a kingdom people, a kingdom people from every tribe and nation and people and language that are followers. Read Revelation 14. The people are very different. In Revelation 14, they have a commitment to the Lamb. They are the first fruits purchased or redeemed from the earth. This is a picture of the raptured church. And when is that going to happen? Just what we said before the wrath of God. People look at Revelation 7 and 14 so simplistically rather than pouring over it in prayer and looking at the events and reading what the events of Scripture reveals to us rather than making assumptions and saying, well, these 144,000, they are Jewish evangelists. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in the Scripture are the 144,000 called evangelists. In chapter 7, they're Jewish. But in chapter, chapter 14, they comprise of the redeemed church of God who God will rapture out. And notice, if you look at Revelation 14 and the church that's mentioned there, you will find that they were around for that Antichrist period. There's nothing in the scripture that tells us that the church will not be here for the Antichrist. If you want to be popular, if you want to sell books, if you want to get a lot of clicks, then tell the people what they want to hear. You won't have problems. You won't have suffering. You're not going to go through any diff difficult time of persecution. You'll be out long before that happens. That's what they want to hear. But a true teacher of the scripture does not say what the people want them to hear, but rather they say what God wants the people to hear. His truth. His word, indeed, the church will see the Antichrist. Be ready, be watching, be alert, and be individuals that pray now that they may have a God-pleasing testimony if they should be alive when this happens. Well, we're going to conclude our conference for this evening. And tomorrow when we gather back, Tomorrow morning, there's just one message I have left. And that message is a message of instruction for believers in light of the changes in this world and the fact that the last days are approaching. The fact that things in this world are converging upon what the scripture calls the Ahritayamin, the end times. So until then, May God bless you. I thank you for attending our conference. My hope and prayer is that you've heard things that will challenge you, that will cause you to further study and show yourselves approved. We need to remember that iron sharpens iron. And therefore, pouring over these scriptures, 
Not so there's always an agreement. It's healthy if we do not agree. I learn more because I'm forced to the scriptures when I hear someone they say things that I don't agree with. And many times I learn they're right and I'm wrong. God teaches me frequently from people that at first I didn't agree with. I thought they were misguided and I learned, no, I was the one that was misguided. I was the one that needed to study more. I was the one that was in need of discipleship from this individual. My hope is that we're all humble enough and thirsty enough for the word of God that we pursue truth and we allow that truth to transform us into the people that God wants us to be. Well, I'll close with that. Until tomorrow morning, thank you. Good night and shalom from Israel.